remind somebody about it in the moment, but you can't teach it when they're distressed. It has to be taught when they're not distressed, and then they need to be coached to use it when they are distressed. <clears throat> okay, um, more modulation. Uh, the book is very interesting. It recommends the use of keeping all kinds of modulation tools available. Right? In, in wherever the kids are living or going to school, just let's have, let's have a tool chest here. <laughs> Blankets, stress balls, or, you know, whatever that you can use when you're agitated. Okay. Affect expression, teaching kids now. You now have words for it. You have ways to calm yourself. Now, you know what? It's worth now talking to other people about it. Because when you tell people how you feel, you increase the chances that you're going to get a response that's helpful. Right? If people don't know what's distressing you, they're never going to be able to meet you where you are. It doesn't guarantee it, but it increases the chance. So this is all about developing communication skills around feelings. Right? But if you think about it, it's very hard to communicate in a constructive way about feelings if you're not in control of the feelings. If you're exploding, you're not communicating effectively with somebody else. If you want to tell somebody, you know, I'm really angry because I feel that you really uh, kind of ignored me in that situation and you didn't, you know, you were paying attention to everybody else and I was trying to uh, get your eye and be heard and you weren't paying attention to me, you have to be calm enough to say that. <laughs> you, you cannot be saying that and be heard in an agitated state. So this is all about teaching affect expression. Okay. And then the final thing that they talk about is this competency, um, which includes two major elements. One is strengthening what is called executive functions, and the other one is called building self-development and identity. And executive uh, functioning is really a lot about problem solving and making choices, <laughs> helping kids think through in advance, particularly things that you know are going to be stressful. If you know a visit with the parent is going to be difficult, let's sit down and think of all the things that might happen and ways that you might handle those things that happen and what the possible outcomes of that might be and make some choices before about what you might do. So that's, I can tell you for these kids that's a very foreign concept. That you would actually sit down and think through in advance how you might handle a situation. Is the term executive function function actually uh or executive function yes. on the higher level. Yes. Yes. Um, so, just gives you a sense of, of that. And it, where there's been negative events that have happened, to review those afterwards so people learn from them, right? So that they don't keep repeating them. Um, and this is very important because I think we often overlook this. And it's related to the next slide, I feel. Um, <coughs> We really need to help kids in this situation build a sense of self. Um, they are tossed around. Nobody's given them any kind of consistent feedback about anything. There's confusions about who they are on a personal level, what their strengths are, how they, because they behave in such erratic ways across situations, they often don't have themselves as, a sense of themselves as, you know, I'm this kind of person. Most of us have a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty responsible person, or I'm a pretty uh, energetic person, or I'm, a, I'm somebody who kind of likes to watch and let other people take leadership and make a decision after I've watched. We have senses of ourselves and how we act in a variety of situations. These kids rarely have that. It's just the, they, they are confused to themselves and the world is confusing. So the whole issue is how to help kids see themselves for who they are, what they are, what they, how they behave, and therefore, what the future might look like. If you don't know who you are today, you cannot plan for the future. We do all this talking about independent uh, functioning and what independent, what's the, what's the word that we talk about with adolescents? <laughs> independent living, we're preparing them for independent living, but if they don't know who they are right here and now, it's very hard to talk about, you know, what's going to be five years from now. You know, we can't talk to them about plans for the future if we're not talking to them about who they are now. And, and I think this is a huge piece. Now, the thing that is not in the Kinneberg and Beth, um, this is more about building self-development and identity. And I, I, again, I just want to say this piece about the racial issue because 
I put that in there. The rest of it is in that book. I don't think it, it tends enough to that. We have to be particularly aware of the fact that if we're dealing with kids of color, particularly, they're going to meet uh, negative experiences based on that. Forget about everything else in the world. Okay? And so we have to be particularly aware of the significant roles that racial identity and internalized racial oppression plays. That is, how do they see themselves as people of color in a society in which being of color is not valued positively? And we need to address that and help them address that. They need to learn their history. They need to learn how people have struggled and fought to, to overcome oppression. There, there really is a historical element of this that helps people build a sense of identity and pride. That if we don't give kids and they just see uh, people in poverty, people downtrodden, and that's what they're identified with, it's very hard to go look at the future. Yes? But that, this came up in class, but that goes with the assumption that there's cultural competency regarding how you approach that situation and cultural competency with the research time. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, yes. <laughs> so that's why I really am pushing this workshop. And I would like to see everybody uh, who works in the system take it and ultimately resource care will take it. Because yes, 100% I agree with you. Um, Okay, so the other point that I really want to make sure I make before we call it a night is this issue of connections. Because Bath talks about connections, Blaustein and Kinneberg talk about identity. But I, this is my, and this is what I was kind of just saying. I don't think you can build identity without having connections. We develop a sense of who we are in relationship to other people in the world and where we stand in the world. And so this notion of making sure when we're working with kids that we build on any positive connections and support those connections is really critical. Now I am aware that DCPMP supports that notion for kids moving toward independent living. But I want to just give you an example of where that doesn't happen or I don't think it happens. Much earlier, okay, so that when we get to the point that we're talking about independent living, it's almost after the fact. Now, right now, I'm, <clears throat> I'm working, uh, I'm sitting on the model court in Essex County. We were able to get a grant to get everybody in the model court to, do, uh, to go through the train, uh, doing racism training. And we're working, looking at a lot of different procedures and policies. One of the things we, we started to look at, a number of us, is the question of who supervises visitation. Um, because, you know, there may be lots of family members or friends who could supervise visitation who are not in a position to take a kid to live with them. When, you, when, when we remove a kid from a home and we put them with non-kid especially, they end up typically only seeing the parents or the people the parent brings to a particular visit if they get permission to. But let's say grandma has regular Saturday dinners. Grandma can't take the kid, but has regular family Saturday dinners. The kid would go every Saturday to dinner there and can't do that anymore. Now, why are we not addressing that? So here's the thing. We, I think we've been very um, focused on the parent-child relationship and not the whole range of connections until we start talking about independent living. When we start talking about independent living, then all of a sudden we start talking about connections. But we've often not done anything to maintain those connections for the five years preceding the decision to move ahead with independent living. And so it often starts much earlier. And we know that once kids come out of the system, they always go back to their families anyway. I mean, almost always. So why are we not working to build those the ones that are positive, those positive relationships, right from the time of place? Now, the argument that has come back has been, takes a lot of work, and it does, but I would argue that it's the kind of work that has to be done at the beginning, because once that gets set up properly, there's actually less work for the caseworkers to do. If there's other people in the kid's environment that the kid, who are responsible, the kid can relate to in a number of different ways, then there's a lot of less work for the division. So. Just put that out there. So I think there needs to be a consistency of connections that goes beyond the issue of residential and legal permanency. It's really about all the connections that kids might have or that we want to help sustain or build. And the other connection that I want to just put out there and then I'll stop is the connection between the resource parent and the parent. <clears throat> because
because that is the connection that if we build, will make all the difference regardless of what the ultimate permanency plan is for a kid. Uh, and every, you know, there's been a lot of work nationally looking at what it takes to build that connection and what the positive impact on, on the outcome for the kid is regardless of whether they go home or they don't go home. If they go home, the resource parent often continues to be a support network for the birth parent. If they don't go home, the resource parent is much more likely to let such a child maintain contact with the birth family because they know these people are not the devil incarnate. So, and that, that the kid doesn't have to feel like they lost this family even though they got adopted into a new one. So, this issue of connections, I think, is about identity because it's about how you see yourself. I'm part of this family, I'm part of this group, I'm part of this culture, I'm part of this religion. I'm part this is how we identify ourselves. And if we start severing those connections, kids can't develop any kind of positive self-identity. So I think those are very related. Um, I think that is the end. Is that the last one? Yep. Good. So I know we're just about out of time, and I'll take any questions, or I'll stay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, how many times can a child be facing foster care and then go back to their family? Because I worked in a daycare, and I really understand two little girls, and they came in when I was there in the winter, and they had been there two weeks before. It's just, how is that going to affect the child if they move them into foster care and then come back and then take them out again? Like how many well, the goal, are, when, when there's a reunification, the goal is that that's supposed to be permanent, right? The goal is not that we're going to pull them back again, right? Now, there are issues related to how you assess whether a family is ready to be reunified and how much support you provide for the family once they're reunified and what kind of work you did to build up to the reunification. So I think there are issues related to that, but there is there is a legal time issue. It's not a number of places, but if a child has been out of the home for 15 out of the last 22 months, the division is mandated to come into court with a permanency plan that involves essentially termination. But but it doesn't matter how many times. It's the length of time within a time period. So they can go back and forth. They can go back and forth. It's certainly not what anybody wants. Other questions?